An enormous nuclear submarine poses a real threat in the ocean. You could have no idea that it's floating beneath you, and yet it carries a thermonuclear weapon that could destroy an entire continent. Quiet and inconspicuous, it can lie on the seafloor for a whole year, waiting for the order to strike. You would think that such a deadly weapon would be banned, but recent events suggest otherwise. Not long ago, a Russian doomsday submarine was spotted in the Arctic. It surfaced in the middle of the ice, stayed in that position for several hours, then dived back down. What's interesting is that Putin himself hasn't been seen on TV for quite a while now, and what better place for him to hide than in an eternally frozen wasteland armed with nuclear missiles? Russia's top nuclear-powered submarine has gone missing. I think you get the idea, but what is this doomsday vehicle anyway? The K-329 Belgorod nuclear submarine was originally part of the Ante project. It was supposed to be fairly standard in its construction. Its closest counterpart was a submarine called the Kursk, which sank in the Barents Sea in the year 2000. I don't know whether it was the Kursk disaster or some other factor that had an effect on the engineers, but the Belgorod was heavily modified. An additional 100-foot compartment was cut into its central section where the missiles had previously been located. The nuclear-powered submarine's overall length is over 590 feet, a new record. To give you a better idea of its size, take a nine-story building, set it on its side, and do that six times in a row, end to end. That's how huge this thing is. So it would be really important if that uh, Belgorod is not operational until 2027. As a result, the 600-foot Belgorod is the longest submarine in the world, 32 feet longer than the U.S.'s Ohio class, which are currently considered the most powerful subs on Earth. However, would the Kursk be able to compete with them? It's actually quite likely, because the Russian ship wasn't made longer to set a record, but to accommodate the world's first nuclear-armed stealth torpedoes, as well as equipment for intelligence gathering. In addition, the thermonuclear torpedoes aren't just inside the submarine, they also float freely on the bottom of the seas and oceans, waiting for a command. Underneath the submarine is a special compartment through which repair drones can be launched to service these torpedoes. Strategic nuclear submarines could lurk out of sight at the bottom of the ocean for weeks, even months at a time. They could come to within a few miles of America's Atlantic or Pacific coasts, some experts insist that these Poseidon torpedoes are capable of traveling hundreds of miles underwater and causing nuclear tsunamis. Both U.S. and Russian officials have reported that the torpedoes could deliver warheads weighing several megatons, setting off radioactive waves that would render long stretches of coastline uninhabitable for decades. That seems entirely possible for a 65-foot underwater rocket weighing 100 tons. The thought of such a terrifying weapon in the hands of not the brightest person certainly increases the danger factor. By the way, it's quite possible that the surfacing of the Kursk in the Arctic is just an attempt to attract the attention of the U.S. military. Two accompanying submarines were spotted en route from St. Petersburg towards Antarctica. Their path crossed through Estonia, Sweden, and Denmark. An object would occasionally show up on radar only to quickly disappear, so these flashes were chalked up to a software error. However, in the territory between Norway and the UK, two large silhouettes were clearly visible beneath the surface. The Royal Navy immediately moved in to inspect the objects and discovered the Russian submarines Severodvinsk and Vepr, which surfaced as if nothing had happened. Of course, the UK was not amused and their military quickly intercepted the submarines and turned them back towards Russia. These actions caused quite a stir in the United States government who then began tracking the submarines and sent drones to keep an eye on them. As a result, the drones discovered the location of the Doomsday submarine, which was floating on the surface in the Arctic as it was being resupplied with food from a Russian ship. NATO was so disturbed by this discovery that they immediately sent naval forces to the edge of Russia's territorial waters. The U.S. portion of the fleet alone consists of 23 ships, all of which are in the Black Sea quite a serious mess, and all caused by just two submarines, or maybe three. But that Belgorod is somewhere under sea, and its whereabouts are unknown. But both the Severodvinsk and the Vepr are nuclear submarines armed to the very teeth. 
Among their arsenal of weapons are powerful torpedoes capable of destroying underwater targets and maneuverable cruise missiles for enemies on the surface. It's uh, very capable, it's very quiet. So that's uh, the most important thing, I think, in submarine warfare. In previous years, the two nuclear submarines had sailed on the surface along the entire coast of Norway, probably because the vessels weren't combat ready. But now it's been confirmed by the Royal Navy that these subs did dive down beneath the water and resurface later, indicating that both submarines are fully operational. The Russians have increased uh, their presence in uh, all bodies of water around Europe and in the Atlantic. Both submarines have nuclear reactors that enable them to stay underwater for more than three months at a time, although this claim seems dubious given that these ships surfaced ahead of schedule directly in the firing range of the Norwegian Navy. There are two possible reasons for this. Either the Severodvinsk and the Vepper don't actually live up to their supposed capabilities, or they surfaced as another act of provocation. If the second option is correct, then it worked, because this display caused the United States to send two dozen of its best ships into the waters neighboring Russia. Upon learning of this, the Kremlin sounded the alarm because at least 23 battleships were aggressively approaching closer and closer. Today, it's known that the NATO ships that entered the Black Sea were American missile destroyers like the USS Ross. This is a huge 500-foot steel monster stuffed with a whole bunch of advanced weaponry. It carries at least two launchers with a total ammunition capacity of 100 guided missiles. Each of these projectiles has its own radar and homing head, which can independently calculate the enemy's position and transmit the data to the rest of the missiles. Thus, each target receives the exact amount of explosives needed to destroy it. Besides missiles, the USS Ross is also armed with a 127mm Mark 45 artillery mount, which leaves a crater in the ground with each shot. Even the most durable bunker falls apart in just a few hits. The ship has an answer for aerial targets too, specifically two 25mm automatic cannons and four heavy machine guns that can leave any aircraft riddled with holes. At the head of this machine gun gang is the fastest firing gun in the world, the Phalanx Sea Wiz. That's right, the very pseudo-laser that you've most certainly heard of. Imagine a single ship that can destroy an entire fleet. It's frightening to think of what 23 of them could do. Naturally, destroyers like the USS Ross are also prepared to take out subsurface threats. To have two torpedo tubes to help them do so, Russian submarines have reason to fear for their integrity and safety. And seeing what is happening in Russia, what's happening around you here, what's the future of your country? Russia's only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, is being prepared to help its underwater comrades because it's the only vessel capable of standing up to the American Navy. Or is it? Amazingly, at this crucial moment, the important ship inexplicably caught fire. Don't be so surprised, the Admiral Kuznetsov seems to always have a problem for one reason or another. Sometimes a crane falls on it, sometimes it gets struck by a rocket, and sometimes it catches on fire. Is it possible that this was all an act of sabotage? However, the most we can report with reliable information is that the fire was successfully put out before it caused much damage, but it did cause a lot of panic and stress. It will be terribly humiliating for, for the Kremlin if that will happen again. What makes this aircraft carrier stand out? First of all, its size, 985 feet long and 236 feet wide. That's like three football fields. This giant is designed to carry 28 firefighters and 24 combat helicopters. I think it's perfectly clear that such a fleet of equipment would present a significant threat to any enemy, especially if the aircraft are armed with the powerful Kinzhal hypersonic missile systems. Unlike many other warships in its class, Admiral Kuznetsov is actually capable of defending itself. For example, these Kinzhal or Dagger missiles. This projectile is capable of reaching speeds of 1,300 feet per second and flying up to 12 miles in the sky, raining down deadly blows on key enemy positions. While the Admiral Kuznetsov and its hypersonic Kinzals seem scary, they stand no chance against nuclear submarines, the very oldest of which could still destroy this miracle of engineering. The main uh, goals of this deployment is exactly that, to attract attention 
because uh, actually that was the missing element in the Russian image as the great power equal to the United States. For example, the K-19 submarine could certainly put up a fight against the Kuznetsov. This was Russia's first ballistic missile nuclear submarine, as well as a response to the USS Nautilus. However, its production and testing were rushed to the point that even its captain didn't believe it was fit for combat. But it was completed nonetheless, and over time it turned into a nuclear time bomb. Here's why. In the spring of 1961, the Soviet K-19 was conducting exercises in the North Atlantic. However, in the middle of a maneuver, it had a malfunction when a coolant pipe burst. The situation was unimaginably dangerous. Angle of the submarine would be 40-50 degrees, which was very dangerous. At the time of the incident, the K-19 was operating near a NATO base in the Atlantic, and the explosion, albeit an accidental one, could have led the U.S. and its allies to believe that the Soviet Union was trying to start a full-scale nuclear war. Upon learning of the leak, Captain Zativ immediately asked for volunteers to go into the reactor compartment and fix the leak. Without sufficient equipment to protect themselves, the entire team knew that whoever volunteered would never return. Nevertheless, 21 brave men immediately volunteered. Luckily, the temporary cooling system that the team set up worked well, long enough for a Russian S-270 ship to show up at the last minute and evacuate the crew. The K-19 submarine was towed back to base. However, the engineering team received significant doses of radiation through poisonous gas and steam while installing the makeshift device. Although a complete disaster was averted, it cost the volunteers their lives over the following two years. And even though the submarine was returned to service a few months after the incident, it experienced failures wherever it went. In 1969, it collided with the USS Gatto submarine, and three years later, a fire on board led to 32 casualties. The power of that nuclear submarine fleet, after all, remains awesome. But what is its mission these days? With that, our videos come to an end. Thanks for watching until the end. We'd be tremendously grateful if you'd subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below about the video. Have a great day, everyone. See you soon.